Five-year-old boy, when his family left their home in Canada and immigrated to the United States, his Canadian-born father had always wanted to be an American, so he and his wife packed up their five children, and they moved into a tiny two-bedroom house in Stratton, Maine. My dad joined the one-room schoolhouse in Copeland Plantation, and unfortunately there, they didn't have any English as a second language programs. In 1938, he picked up what he could, and he became an easy target. Kids made fun of him because he didn't understand English, because he was French, and because he was poor. Looking for a way to fit in, he joined them, and he made fun of himself too. As a student, he became both a disruption and a disappointment in the classroom. He told me about this one time that he'd made a noisemaker out of a bicycle spoke and a rubber band and a washer. And he'd put it under the back of his leg, and he'd kind of lift up his leg a little bit, and on the wooden seat, the washer invention would make a brrrr noise. Well, this angered his teacher, but it didn't amuse his classmates. And for a bit, he became very popular with his peers, and even more popular when he found enough materials to make one of those noisemakers for each of the boys in his class. <laughs> My dad recalls that as his fondest school memory. He also recalls his teacher's wrath when she finally figured out where the distraction was coming from, but he assured me that the belt that he got from his dad was well worth it to feel good at school for one of the only times ever. At the end of seventh grade, my dad's school days ended. Like his older brothers and sisters, he was told he had to go to work to support his family. By then, he understood basic math and spoke English, but he certainly couldn't read it. He began logging and twitching trees out of the woods as a seventh grader. Then he stepped into his father's footsteps and he became a carpenter. And while he couldn't read a book, he was very skilled at reading a ruler. And in Farmington, he built the house that I grew up in and countless others for customers in that area. As early as my elementary school years, I remember my mom saying to my dad, Jean, if you do not build for some of these houses, we are not gonna be able to pay the utilities this month. He always avoided the necessary paperwork that came along with running his own business. I was in fourth grade when he actually started asking me to write up his bills. He told me it was because my penmanship was so good and his was so poor. And while he may have appreciated my neat handwriting, I actually realized later that it was because he was functionally illiterate that he was asking me to do that work. Aside from carpentry and logging, during his 70 years in the main workforce, he was a gas station attendant, a truck driver, a snowplow driver, and a handyman. Are those the jobs that he would have chosen for himself had he possessed a high school diploma or even a college degree? That is why I teach. I teach to create opportunities and choices unlike the options my dad faced due to childhood poverty that resulted in his lack of education and his lack of open doors. It's nearly 100 years later, and some of my students at Windsor Elementary School are coming to school struggling also with childhood poverty. Some are too cold to sleep at night. Some live in fear and are anxiety-filled because of their drug-dependent caretakers. Some have issues with housing, and others are hungry at home. In my role as the Learning Commons teacher at Windsor Elementary School, I am afforded this unique opportunity of touching the lives of all 300 students from the time they enter kindergarten until the time they leave in eighth grade. In my position, I get to introduce students to amazing literature. I get to share knowledge of how to access true and reliable information. I get to incite, excite and involve them in hands-on engineering challenges. And whether I'm teaching kindergarten students about pollination through hands-on play during no mow, may, no mow May, instructing third graders on how to build circuitry, or helping a middle school student with a really tough, complicated 3D print design, I am, at the same time, looking for a student who might need a kind word, a pat on the shoulder, a jacket at recess, and in one instance, a birthday present. At our school, we publicized birthdays on the morning announcements. So when one of my sixth grade students came to class last fall, I was kind of surprised to see her looking so down, especially since it had just been announced that it was her birthday. When I wished her a happy birthday and asked how she'd be celebrating that evening, she looked at me in the strangest way and she replied, I won't, my grandparents can't afford presents. Her eyes told me everything I needed to hear. So I responded with, well, that's okay. Hey, let's just pretend that my pencil right here is a magic wand and I get to give you any birthday wish you can ask for. 
She could have asked for an iPhone, she could have asked for a dog, she could have asked for a new computer, but you know what, she didn't. She said, Mrs. Janzewski, I really love to paint, so I guess I would ask for some paper and a watercolor set. You know how the story ends. She got to unwrap that gift the day after her birthday, and since then, I have received some beautiful pieces of art that I proudly display in the library. This is what teachers do nowadays. Unlike during my dad's school era, teachers create safe harbors in classrooms. We create communities that care, and we build all students up. We feed them with our lunch programs, we provide dentistry, we give them food to take home on the weekends, we give them warm boots and coats and mittens and hats, we donate gifts to them and their families at Christmas time. And you know what else we do? We buy birthday presents when we know that no one else can. And while we as culturally responsive teachers try to meet those needs, more needs to be done. As a society, we need to end childhood poverty so that students can come to school ready to learn and so that teachers can spend that precious time preparing them for success. And we can do just that by ending childhood poverty. I assure you, and I'm sure that you all are thinking, great, Crystal, what are you gonna do? Get out that magic pencil again? Well, actually, we nearly did it in 2021 without my magic pencil. Before the pandemic, the national poverty rate was 12.4%. And after the US government asked, um, um, excuse me, offered the pandemic relief in the form of the child tax credit, the childhood poverty rate dropped to 5.1. No, that's not zero but it did do a lot to help children whose families spent that money on food, utility, housing, and childcare. So imagine how much better it would be to teach students who aren't hungry, who have warm houses to sleep in, who aren't raising themselves at home. Research suggests that reducing childhood poverty has long-term positive effects on children's health, their educational attainment, and future earnings. But teachers, no matter, no matter how dedicated and caring we are, we can't do it alone. In my role as the 2024 Kennebec County Teacher of the Year, I will encourage my local, my state, and even national leadership to consider the role that childhood poverty plays in education, and I will implore them to adopt policy to end it. Doors were closed for my father and many generations before him. We need to work together to open doors by breaking the cycle of childhood poverty for this generation and for those that will come after.